Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The Past and Future of Reparations. And I'm pleased to be joined by lead scholar and guest Laurie Balfour from the University of Virginia. My name is Andy Mink, and I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, I know each and every one of us is pretty sick of speaking into and listening from our laptops. I'm sure we're Zoomed out and we are webinared out, but it's always a pleasure to work with so many uh, educators from across the country. Of course, uh, we, we've got our Los Angeles contingent as we often do. Uh, I see Jay LeBlanc is here from Denver. Uh, good friend Hadley Galbraith, who was in our pro program last summer from Iowa is with us. Um, I really do hope that you find a way to connect with each other as much as you can in the chat box and realize that there's a network of humanists and humanities teachers all across the country who are interested in the kind of work uh, that you are. I always like to thank uh, my colleagues and my staff, Libby Taylor and Mike Williams as well. Uh, Libby is our point person with the PowerPoints and the scholars for our webinar series. Uh, Mike is the lead on our online course catalog and the three of us uh, find really our primary mission and passion for this kind of work is to encourage teacher agency and really recognize the professional uh, skills and expertise and background that all of you have. So anything we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to reach out to email us or to uh, find us on the socials and we'll be glad, be glad to uh, respond. The center unfortunately is a, is a dark and barren place right now. Um, we closed uh, as many of the organizations around the country did almost eight weeks ago. Um, it was important for us that the fellows that come to the center every day were able to turn their attention to their home campuses and families. As a matter of fact, this year we had six international scholars and they were in early March concerned about getting out of the country. Uh, so while you can't visit us in Durham physically, you can visit us uh, online. And I would encourage you to take a look at our website. Uh, the URL is at the bottom of the screen and visit uh, not just the education work, but the scholarly content that we create on a regular basis in the hopes that it can be infused in and be important in your teaching. For example, if you use that search button uh, tonight, right now, and you typed in reparation, you would find 57 results. And these range from scholarly essays and books written by fellows to education uh, programs and, and uh, initiatives like the one we're doing tonight. All of these are free and they're open. And again, we hope you'll find them valuable in your teaching. I do want to uh, take a moment to apologize again for uh, two sessions ago, for the first time in over 200 webinars, my home internet uh, failed me and I was unable to start the webinar on time. Uh, Pat Woods is uh, is chuckling to herself right now. I'd see that she's giving me a little bit of a hard time in the chat box. Um, if you are interested in this particular uh, session, we did reschedule it for next Thursday, May the 7th. Because we had to reschedule it though, it essentially opens up the registration. So when I turned this on right before we went live, there were 80 seats left. And so if you're interested in joining Pride and Prejudice in its third century with Nicholas Dames, Professor of Humanities from Columbia University, please uh, take a moment, go and sign up. And a week from tonight, we'll have our last webinar of the season. A couple of other uh, announcements I'd like to uh, to make and to remind you of. We are currently accepting applications for the Teachers Advisory Council. I see many of our both past and present uh, TAC members in the room tonight, Katie Willett. Uh, always good to see her with us. Uh, Jamie Lathan, uh, fellow Wahoo and good friend uh, is in the room. Um, and we would love to have representation from all over the country and all backgrounds. If you're interested, please do make an application by May the 22nd. Um, we do ask you to get a letter of support from your immediate supervisor or principal. And honestly, our number one reason for doing that is so that they are aware of your commitment. And when you come to North Carolina next October, uh, that they can't tell you that you can't get us up. So they've already signed off on it. Uh, it may take a little extra work to get that during this uh, this COVID, uh, COVID turn down, but, but please think about, uh, particularly if you attend a lot of our webinars and participate in a lot of our uh, activities. I also want to note that our next series of online courses opens on May 26. We're currently accepting registrations. Uh, these courses each earn up to 35 hours of professional development credit and for many states and Los Angeles Unified we are pre-approved so that those credits do translate to the kind of salary points and acknowledgement and certification that you might need. Uh, so please use our, our website to sign up for them. And then finally we do have two seats left 
at the Five Day Institute in late July with A.D. Carson, professor of music at the University of Virginia, Larry's colleague up in Charlottesville. Uh, we'll be working with A.D. and other scholars around the use of hip hop and the ways in which art and music and hip hop can help better understand the African-American experience. This is not a history course. This is a, a, a multidisciplinary humanities course on understanding the ways that music can reveal and give access to other experiences. And we would love to have any of you sign up and register to join us. We've got two seats left. A couple of reminders for tonight's session. Uh, this is a audio and PowerPoint webinar, so you'll hear my voice and Laurie's voice, but we won't be able to hear yours at least uh, orally. We will hear you though in the chat box. Down at the very bottom of your control panel stack, there is a chat function that allows you to um, heckle me, it allows you to ask questions, it allows you to share resources, and actually we're going to ask you to respond to several open-ended questions tonight. So in that chat box you can type whatever you like and as the moderator my job is to um, is to mine what you've uh, shared and written and bring it to the conversation. If you do share something, particularly a question, and we don't get to it for some reason and it rolls out of uh, sight, please type it back in. I don't mind at all if you uh, if you ask it several times to make sure that we get answered what you need answered. So uh, that's my introduction for uh, tonight's uh, session. This is our third to last webinar for the 2019-2020 uh, season. And I'm extremely pleased to have uh, Dr. Lori Balfour, I'm sorry, Lori Balfour, uh, as we would say in Charlottesville, professor of politics from the University of Virginia to join us. I also wanna note that Jedediah Just Anderson uh, we can call him Jay, a high school teacher in Charlotte Mecklenburg, Charlotte, North Carolina, is our TA tonight. Uh, Jay is a member of our um, is a member of our teacher advisory council, and one of the things we ask them to do is serve in our webinars as a TA. What that means is he'll be in the chat box, dropping questions, uh, responding to things, maybe sharing some resources. Please do use him in this sort of undercurrent back channel conversation. Uh, to really fully explore and discuss the topic that we'll be working with tonight. Uh, so having said all that, uh, Laurie, I'm looking quickly for your name to unmute you. There you are. Hey, Laurie, how are things in Charlottesville? There we go. Things are hey. great in Charlottesville. A little Fantastic. rainy, but otherwise. Well, I want to thank um, you for joining us. And um, you've put together a great uh, slide deck tonight. I know this is a complicated and compelling topic. Um, all the folks that are in the room with us tonight are, are faced sometimes, I think, with, with working with students who hear about or have questions about topics like this, and sometimes just working with a, a scholar and an expert in this field, and just to be able to be more knowledgeable about how we respond to their, their curiosities and their questions is really the most important. Um, I, I'm wondering, just as we get started, just as a way of introduction, I'm wondering um, how your students at, at UVA respond to this topic. When you're a teacher too, you're an educator, how, how does this general topic, and how has it changed over the last 10 years, five years, 15 years? Well, it's changed extraordinarily um, at, over the, the past several years. When I first, I first got to UVA in 2001, and when I was teaching, uh, course on African-American political thought, one of the things that was quite striking was that students were very receptive to the course and really interested in learning about the, um, the history of slavery, of lynching, of um, reconstruction and the ways in which Jim Crow um, enacted new forms of disenfranchisement and terror. And, and there was a way in which they were interested in grappling with the history, but when we got to talking about reparations, when we got to talking about contemporary issues having to do with um, welfare reform and with other kinds of policies that were being affirmative action that were being debated in their lifetimes, they really wanted to draw a pretty bright line between the history and the present. And I think that's changed um, completely. Students are very conscious. Um, the ways in which they need to connect the past to the present and i think really thoughtful about that in a way that i wouldn't have anticipated when i first started doing this work yeah that's really intriguing and again you know context changes everything and 
generations do and the the current always is you know a, a prism uh, of the past and but it's interesting to hear you note that you're you're seeing these you know undergraduate and perhaps even graduate students really start to to blur that line that you said was so bright at the very beginning it's 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 really quite remarkable i think that that students um coming into college now have a have a sense of the importance of history the, of the political importance of history that's um, really completely unlike anything um, that was true, certainly when I was in high school and college. Um, when Toni Morrison published Beloved in 1987, she said she thought that was the book of all her novels that nobody was going to want to read. Um, and so if you think about where we are now in terms of, of thinking about um, the legacies of slavery or the afterlife of slavery, I think it's quite different. Now, whether we're in a different place politically or policy-wise is another question, but um, there's an openness to thinking about reparations that I think is is a real change. Um, That's fascinating. Um, Laurie, you also put together uh, several readings that we asked the attendees and the audience tonight to spend some time with before tonight's session. By the way, to I'm going to say this in sidebar to all the folks in the room tonight. I always tell our lead scholars that you pour through and you spend time with the pre-reading. So I'm going to assume that many of you have. Um, and Laura, we talked about doing a short poll at the beginning. Well, that poll is available. And I think what we had talked about doing was asking the poll now, and that would sort of kickstart tonight's topic. That sounds great. Okay, so you you assigned three readings. Uh, one was a an Atlantic article. One was a article titled "Slavery Reparations Bill Debated in the House," and the third was an article titled uh, "To Share a New World." By the way, you can hear everybody in the in the room now scrambling to find these three. If you're I'm looking hoping, for these three, <laughs> Andy, can um, I cut a sec? Certainly. I, yeah, I'm hoping that the second one, uh, the slavery reparations bill debated yes. in the House, was just a three minute. Clip. That's right. It should have That's been a right. film clip from, from the That's right. So I've got the poll, and you and Libby and I discussed this poll. It's titled, Do You Support Some Form of Monetary Reparations for Slavery and Jim Crow? Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, that's what it says. So um, would you like to frame this at all, or would you like me to launch the poll and ask our audience to uh, to respond? Well, I think it, one one thing that that I thought might be helpful would be to get an opening response and then see at the end whether anyone has changed their minds one way or the other. Um, but it was really a way of just taking the pulse of of uh, people across the country about the question. Great. So I think that's a fantastic idea. So um, we're working. You and I are working on the fly right now. We're going to do the poll at the beginning and then again at the end. Sure. That sounds okay. great. Okay, so for all the audience, uh, for everybody in the audience, what I'm about to do is launch a poll. It's a quick and easy poll. You're going to see the results uh, in real time. I'm only going to leave the poll up for a grand total of 45 seconds. And so in 45 seconds, I am going to close it. So please get ready to respond to the following poll. And Lori, you tell me. Do you see it? Yes. Poll in progress. There it is. There it is. Do you support some form of monetary reparations for slavery and Jim Crow? Select one of the following. And wow, look at the responses coming in. Can you see those, Lori? Can you see them live? I can't see the responses. No, I can. All I can see are the comments in the chat. Got it. All right. So I can see the responses. And when I close it, I'll be able to make it accessible to everyone. I'm going to tell you it's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks, please answer the poll. You've got 20 seconds left. Well, this is high pressure. It is high pressure. That's the only way we do things at the National Humanities. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, folks, only half of you have voted. I know it's tricky, it's difficult. Just a few more seconds. Hmm. 10 more seconds, please. They all, see the problem with this, Laurie, is they're all teachers and they know that time when you're a teacher is completely artificial. And I say 10 more seconds, but it's not really 10 more seconds. It's it's when I think the, the, that the, the ebb and flow is kind of uh, slowed down. 
here we go. And it's stranger online, as I've discovered when my classes have gone to Zoom. That's right. Okay, I'm gonna, I really am gonna turn it off in 10 seconds now. I'm not kidding. And I'm gonna close the poll now. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. Can you see That's, those? Yes, it's very okay. interesting. Yeah, look at that. Do you support some form of monetary reparations for slavery and Jim Crow? 26% strongly agree. You guys can read this, I don't need to read it to you, but 45% uh, agree, 21% don't know, six disagree, two strongly disagree. Excellent. So keep that in the back of your mind, and then we're gonna do this poll again at the end. And I, I don't know that our, our goal is to change your mind one way or the other, but it'll be a better informed response for sure. Okay, so now, Lori, I'm gonna give you the mouse, and I'm gonna invite you to lead the session. Okay, okay. great. You should be able to advance uh, the slides now. Okay. Um... Before I start, I, I do want to say, uh, I didn't get to say at the very beginning how grateful I am to, to Andy and to Libby for the invitation and, uh, and to all of you. I mean, I imagine many of you have already spent all day looking at and listening to um, a screen. So, uh, you know, to take another hour and a half out of the day to do that um, is much appreciated, especially since uh, this, is a, this is really meant to be a conversation. So there is no... Um, there is no position I expect anyone to be at at the beginning, um, but it's. Uh, I hope that this will provide some information for thinking about um, issues of reparations. So, um, I'm... there it is. Yep. Okay. Great. So demands for reparations for slavery and its legacies are not new. They've long played a role in um, black struggles for freedom in the U.S. They've been parsed and debated by academics and lawyers, and they're peri periodically held up by um, conservative commentators as emblematic of the dangers of race conscious policies. One thing that I think is not often noted is um, that considerations, uh, that apart from considerations of policies to reimburse slave owners for their loss of property uh, and to stave off the Civil War, there's really never been a national consideration of what was owed to um, the women and men who labored uh, for centuries or for the crimes of Jim Crow. As one uh, legal scholar said, the history of black reparations in the US would be a history of a non-event. So part of the reason I wanted to start um, with the hearings uh, from last summer is because um, it raised the question anew um, has the time come to consider reparations for slavery and Jim Crow? Um, and the hearings uh, were the first time uh, that the um, HR 40, which has been introduced in every Congress since 1989, received a, a great deal of public attention. So it seemed like there was potentially uh, a new moment in, in some senses. And part of the reason I asked you to listen to the uh, to the clip was to get a sense also of the range of the speakers, both for and against the bill, um, which was uh, a proposal to establish a commission to study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans. The idea is then that the the bill is really um, just a, a preliminary step to to set up a commission. Um, and I wanted to begin with some open-ended questions about your response to those very short clips that we heard from ta Coates, from Danny Glover, um, from Representative uh, Sheila Jackson Lee and others, and to ask whether any of the speakers um, expressed your view of reparations. So maybe let's take these uh, one at a time. And again, we, would, we are encouraging, we'd love to hear your voices in the chat box. Um, did any of the speakers in the hearings express your view? Did any of the speakers change your view? Did you learn anything new from their comments? Take a moment, please, and uh, reflect on the short video clip that you watched and share with us how, how the speakers may have impacted your feelings about this topic. And Laurie, this is where you and I sort of pause for a moment because folks are typing in uh, quickly. Juliet, thank you for joining us. Coates has confirmed my feelings. 
Um, and Coates has really been, um, you know, out ahead in many ways of articulating the reasons for reparations in a way that is broadly accessible. Uh, the article from The Atlantic did not include anything that was new to people who have been thinking and arguing about reparations for many years, but he said it in a way that uh, was just extraordinary. And I, I think it, as an academic, it was a little, um, it was it was very humbling to see how someone could take so much information and make an argument so powerful. And that's part of the reason that I think his voice is, has had such an impact. Great. Jamie Lathan is offering, uh, looks like Coates is really what many of our folks are talking about. Jamie notes that he likes the way he responded directly to Speaker McConnell. Krista Calkins. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that the, you know, that the comment that this is something that was in the past is something it, that um, the Coates refers to that that Speaker McConnell had mentioned. Um, that's one of the ways in which I think discussions about reparations have really changed from the debates at the turn of the 20th century, uh, that people are increasingly recognizing the ongoingness of the legacies of slavery and the idea that it ended in 1863 or 1865 is no longer um, taken for granted, I think, in these discussions, but it's subject to debate. And that's one of the ways in which this new attention, I think, has shifted our, you know, the, the very ground on which the, the discussion is um, taking place. Mm -hmm. Judith Will, Katie Willett, talks too about um, it being a difficult read. Uh, the book, I, I suppose they mean, uh, or Katie meant. And then Will and Judith are saying that they, they like the way that he talked about having to, to face the issue um, as much as any kind of monetary reparation. Yeah, I think that, that there are, um, you know, they're interconnected issues and it's very hard to sort out um, how to connect the symbolic importance of acknowledgement and apology to um, the importance of making material, uh, material change. So it's an extraordinary complex set of questions as, as a number of you are, are noting. Jamie Lathan is wondering, and I'm assuming, Jamie, you're dire uh, directing this to, to Laurie. What do you think about Coleman Hughes's views on reparations? So Coleman Hughes's comments, he's a, a young um, writer and critic, um, and he was the one uh, figure in, in this particular clip who spoke out um, against reparations. And he expressed an idea that is very widely held, especially among anti-racist scholars and activists, which is, uh, and I'll come back to this at the very end, um, is the idea that that focusing on reparations, which has been so unpopular, in the turn of the 20th century, one poll found that 96% of white Americans opposed reparations, monetary reparations, which, you know, the idea of finding 96% of white Americans who could agree on anything um, was pretty, pretty stunning. So, there's a real argument that focusing on reparations can be a distraction from dealing with uh, the very real, very complex issues of inequity um, in, in the US today, even inequities that uh, come out of the legacy of slavery. Great, thank you. That, that may be the the initial responses, at least, that maybe we should move move through. It's part of my job too to keep us on track with the time. Great. I don't see the place where I can. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry, I moved it on. <laughs> so um, this next slide is meant to do uh, a number of things. It is not meant to be a test of your uh, vision. Um, although um, here's where having a novice um, power pointer comes into play. Um, the point of this, idea, of this slide was really just to give you a, 
visual record of some of the kinds of reparations efforts um, that we've seen around the world since 1865. It's not, um, not in any way exhaustive, um, but it shows you both the geographic range um, and also the, the different uh, time periods in which reparations proposals have been made. Perhaps most famously, Special Field Order 15 uh, in 1865, when General Sherman set aside land that had been abandoned by Confederates for uh, freed people to, to work. And um, this was a very successful experiment. There was also an experiment in uh, Mississippi in um, African-American self-government during the, the Civil War. Um, but uh, those, those efforts were undone uh, by the end of Reconstruction and, and actually before the end of Reconstruction by President Johnson. There was very little public, um, national public effort uh, to uh, consider reparations uh, for the enslaved workers. Thaddeus Stevens' proposal um, for land redistribution was was just was really almost it at the national level, and it didn't go um, very far. If you look ahead on the timeline, you see um, a lawsuit in 1915 that was for um, the taxes from from uh, the cotton production was unsuccessful. Um, <laughs> And um, but there, and there were other efforts as well. There was a slave pension um, effort also that uh, did not um, succeed in getting any kind of, of ongoing support, much less reparations for centuries of labor. Part of the reason that I included the Indian uh, Claims Commission and the Alaska Native uh, Settlement Native Claims Settlement Act is to show too that reparations are a vehicle that have been used for thinking about historic injustice against many groups. Now that said, it should also be noted that they are often woefully incomplete. They can also be used in lieu of other kinds of responses. So in the case of indigenous Americans, in lieu of acknowledging their self-determination or their sovereignty. Um, and they can be controversial. So in the Coates article, you may have seen that uh, German reparations to Israel um, after World War II were quite controversial. There was a concern of being paid for um, suffering that could not ever be repaid. But one of the crucial things I think about the West German example is that it also marked a shift um, from reparations as something that the losers paid to the victors in a war um, to an idea that, um, that becoming a democratic society involved uh, coming to terms at some level with the past. Um, and so it served as a beginning for a range of transitional justice efforts, including those in Chile and South Africa and elsewhere, where the idea of there being uh, a democratic future after violence or civil war um, depended on looking back at the violence, the crimes, the economic theft and so forth that preceded, um, preceded that uh, political transition. The Civil Liberties Act of 1988 is important because that was um, reparations to Japanese Americans who were interned uh, during the Second World War. And it also was a spur to a lot of uh, revitalized reparation activism among um, African Americans. Um, and so we see the first introduction of HR 40 that, um, that we talked about a minute ago, uh, right after the Civil Liberties Act. Um, the other examples include uh, the uh, World Conference Against Racism had a statement against reparations, the U.S. and other nations, I'm sorry, a, a statement calling for redress for the slave trade and slavery, um, which the U.S. and other nations opposed. Um, the Caribbean nations have made demands, which I'll talk about later. Um, the Movement for Black Lives, also something I'll come back to, has um, incorporated reparations into many of their policy ideas. Um, and colleges and universities are trying to come to terms with what they owe um, for having benefited from slavery, in the case of Georgetown, having profited from the sale of slaves. 
So this is, this is a really woefully incomplete list of some of the kinds of efforts, um, and there are many, many more um, that we could talk about. I want to talk about uh, tonight um, of the three, three different kinds of arguments that have been made for reparations for slavery and Jim Crow, moral, economic, and political. Um, I want to focus on the political. So moral arguments um, focus on the injustice of slavery, think about um, slavery as America's original sin, and typically call for atonement and healing. Economic arguments um, envision reparations as repayment, both for the unpaid labor of African Americans and their descendants, um, and for the wealth they produced, and their exclusion from wealth building programs like mortgage assistance programs. Um, and this often reflects um, the, uh, the size of the wealth gap um, in the United States. In 2016, it was estimated that white households um, owned more than, ten, sorry, approximately 10% of the wealth of white households. And Latinx households also were much closer to African American um, families in that gap. Politically, reparations is seen as a kind of reconstruction. It's a way of asking what would be required for the US to be remade on genuinely democratic terms? What would be required for us to have substantive equality and freedom and full citizenship? Um, so if we think about Coates's comment that America begins in black plunder and white democracy, then the question is, what would it take to get to multiracial democracy? Um, and what I'd like to do in order to think that through um, is to look to African-American political thinkers who have made arguments that connected slavery and its legacies to unjust practices in their own times. So I've seen a couple of comments, although I've, I miss them as they scroll up about sort of how do we connect students between the past and the present and I'm hoping that these four thinkers may be useful for doing that. Um, they were not figures who necessarily argued for reparations per se, um, but their work gives us arguments for making those, um, those links, whether students are supportive of reparations or are opposed to them, but to give them the wherewithal to think about how do present day inequalities reflect what happened in the past. And, why should a democratic society um, reckon uh, with the injustices um, that help to constitute it? So the four figures uh, quickly are David Walker, Ida B. Wells Barnett, W.E.B. Du Bois, and um, Martin Luther King Jr. David Walker um, lived from around 1796 to 1830. He was born free in the South. Um, and was an abolitionist. Uh, he moved to the North and was involved in the first um, African-American weekly newspaper, Freedom's Journal. And in 1829, he published his appeal. It was an appeal in four articles um, to the colored citizens of the world, but particularly and very especially to those of the United States of America. Um, and already you can see something really quite striking. Um, he's appealing to colored citizens um, at a time in which most African Americans in the U uh, were enslaved. Um, he's envisioning them as part of a global citizen, citizenry. Uh, and he's trying to connect the abolition of slavery um, to a different kind of a future. Now, one thing to note about David Walker's appeal was that it was published in Boston, but it circulated through the South. It was often smuggled um, by seamen who sewed it into their coats. Um, and it was seen as such a danger that legislatures in Georgia and Louisiana passed anti-literacy laws in response to it. Um, so part of what I think is so important about Walker's appeal is that as he's demanding abolition, he is also envisioning what comes next. And he writes, and this is on the slide, the Americans may say or do as they please, but they have to raise us from the condition of brutes to that of respectable men and to make a national acknowledgement to us for the wrongs they have inflicted upon us. So notice both a demand for a change of condition 
and for an acknowledgement. Um, and I think that, that that's, a, you know, connecting, even though he doesn't use material language, um, connecting a concrete change to, um, to an acknowledgement. One of the things I love about teaching David Walker, especially at the University of Virginia, um, whoops. Oh dear! I, so I have a slide that seems to to have gone um, gone missing. Um, but he, there's a wonderful quotation um, where he takes on Thomas Jefferson directly, and he does so by quoting um, the uh, the Declaration of Independence in detail, and then rebutting uh, Jefferson, basically saying, you know, on what grounds do you deny us who have done nothing to you? Um, of these rights uh, that you hold um, to be uh, self-evident and so important. And um, this was extraordinarily um, influential during Walker's time. He expected that even people who did not uh, read and write, that they would be, um, they would have this read to them and that they would uh, be encouraged by it to, to take the terms of American democracy as their own. Um, to demand the same kinds of freedom that the revolutionaries demanded from, from England. Um, and it's a strategy that gets used again uh, later, for instance, by the Black Panther Party um, and their 10 point um, party platform where they also call for reparations and invoke the idea of 40 acres and a mule from the special field order the Panthers also um, invoke the declaration quoted at length and then demand that it be fulfilled. The second thinker who I think is especially helpful for um, thinking through um, the legacies of slavery and the ongoing political challenges it left is Ida B. Wells Barnett. Um, she was born into slavery in Mississippi in 1862 and died in 1931. She's best known as the, um, the heartbeat of the anti-lynching movement. Uh, she was a committed truth teller who be became an anti-lynching activist after one of her friends was murdered in 1892 in Memphis um, and spent the rest of her, her life um, fighting to tell the truth about um, the killing of um, African-American men, women, and girls. Uh, this quotation is uh, not unique to, uh, to Wells Barnett. It's, it's an argument that Frederick Douglass made many times that you see later from figures like Du Bois and King, but I think it's a really important one because it recasts the history of the Civil War and emancipation. The Civil War of 1861 ended slavery. It left us free, but it also left us homeless, penniless, ignorant, nameless, and friendless. Um, and then there's a comparison to the Russian serfs who were given three acres of land, but to us, no foot of land nor implement was given. We were turned loose to starvation, destitution, and death. So desperate was our condition that some of our statesmen declared it useless to try to save us by legislation as we were doomed to extinction. So part of what I think um, is so important about this claim um, is the way in which it understands emancipation as a moment for, of, among other things, a moment of abandonment um, that 4 million um, men, women, and children were freed without any plan or program to, um, to help uh, help them get set up to establish themselves independently. Um, and this is something that has been a recurrent feature of African-American uh, political thought. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to emphasize Wells Barnett as well uh, is that she also is extremely attentive to the sexual character of white supremacy and to the history of violence against black women and girls. So in a high school classroom, I think it would be quite different, but in colleges, students are quite moved and I think um, often quite surprised to discover the degree to which um, the um, 
the lynchings were committed against women and girls, um, but also the ways in which she forces us to rethink slavery, um, not only as a systematic theft of labor, but also as an institution predicated on sexual harassment and assault. And for people who are thinking about what reparations should look like, um, she is, I think, an important reminder that coming to terms with the history of slavery and Jim Crow requires um, addressing gender and sexuality, that those are central part of that struggle. Um, The third figure who uh, I wanted to uh, mention is W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was born during Reconstruction uh, in Massachusetts, and he died in 1963 on the eve of the civil rights, uh, the March on Washington. Du Bois is the reason that I started thinking about reparations. Um, it was not something that he argued for specifically, and in fact, he ridiculed the effort in 1915 to seek back taxes from the Treasury Department uh, for cotton production. But encountering his work um, and his thinking both about the contributions of enslaved workers and about um, the lost uh, promise of reconstruction really forced me to come to terms with the idea of reparations as, um, as a response to. Um, historic injustice. So the passage I have is from Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, from the very end of the text, when he talks about um, African American spirituals as the one great cultural production of uh, American um, history. And here he writes, uh, I think very pointedly, your country, how came it yours? Before the pilgrims landed, we were here. Here we brought our three gifts and mingled them with yours, a gift of story and song, soft stirring melody in an ill harmonized and unmelodious land, the gift of sweat and brawn to beat back the wilderness, conquer the soil and lay the foundations of this vast economic empire 200 years earlier than your weak hands could have done it. The third, a gift of the spirit. Actively, we have woven ourselves with the very warp and woof of this nation, we fought their battles, shared their sorrow, mingled their blood, our blood with theirs, and generation after generation have pleaded with a headstrong, careless nation to despise not justice, mercy, and truth, lest the nation be stricken, smitten with a curse. And I think one of the things that's so powerful about this passage is the way in which Du Bois brings together the cultural gifts with the economic creation of modern America. So one thing that I think is often lost in debates about reparations is, um, you know, is the question of what African Americans contributed to the making um, of the US. They not only produced the wealth, but they were the greatest source of wealth at the time of the Civil War. And finally, the gift of the spirit, which for Du Bois is both a religious gift, but also I think a gift of um, a deep commitment to freedom. He sees the enslaved as the embodiment of US political ideals in many ways. And this is especially important because he's challenging um, ways of understanding history that move from slavery to freedom um, and that typically wrote African Americans out of the story altogether. So um, his work is dedicated to putting them back into the center of that history. And in 1935, when he published Black Reconstruction, which um, takes up this question in more detail, he makes the further argument that it was the enslaved themselves um, who not only freed themselves from bondage, but freed the nation by turning the tide of the war. And that it was the reconstruction era governments, many of which had black leadership um, that were put in place with African-American voters that rebuilt the Southern states along more democratic lines. And for Du Bois, reconstruction was not a disaster, which is what white historians were saying, but was in fact the first and only time 
the US had um, attempted a multiracial democracy. And so it becomes worthwhile to go back and look at what was tried and then what was um, undone in the period that followed. And one point too, I think about Du Bois's reading of Reconstruction that's especially helpful for thinking about reparations arguments is that he shows how policies that were designed specifically with the freed people in mind, that is, they were tailored to the needs of formerly enslaved people, had benefits that far exceeded those four million people, um, perhaps the greatest of which was access to free primary public education, which was um, part of something that came out of the Reconstruction governments, and um, but ultimately uh, became a, a privilege or a right that was really only available to white children um, as um, access to education and political power were withdrawn towards the end of the 19th century. The fourth and final figure I wanted to mention is, um, I imagine the most uh, familiar, Martin Luther King Jr. He was born in 1929 and died in 1968. And I wanted to mention um, this quotation from the I Have a Dream speech because I think that speech is so often remembered uh, for King's line about um, dreaming of the day when his children would be judged um, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, which is a critical part of King's argument, but an equally critical part is his idea um, that the US had fault, um, had faulted on its debt to African-American citizens. Um, instead of honoring its sacred obligation, he writes, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Now, King's use of the language of the promissory note and the bad check in the I Have a Dream speech um, is largely metaphorical but increasingly across his career, he connects that specific history of African-American, um, uh, of, of slavery and anti-Black racism to the political, social, and economic problems of his day. Um, and so if we move ahead to his last published book during his lifetime, Where Do We Go From Here? Um, we see the ways in which King, uh, first of all, makes a move to distinguish formal equality from real lived equality, um, as he sees how that, um, that moment that Ida B. Wells talked about in 1863 turns into 1954 and 1964 and 1965. So for those of you who are thinking about how to connect your students to this past that seems so distant. I realize for your students, 1965 also seems pretty distant, but this is a repeated pattern of promises made and then broken. Just as an ambivalent nation freed the slaves a century ago with no plan or program to make their freedom meaningful, the still ambivalent nation in 1954 declared school segregation unconstitutional with no plan or program to make integration real. Just as the Congress passed a civil rights bill in 1868 and refused to enforce it, the Congress passed a civil rights bill in 1964 and to this day has failed to enforce it in all its dimensions. Just as the 15th Amendment in 1870 proclaimed Negro suffrage only to permit its de facto withdrawal in half the nation, so in 1965, the voting rights law was passed and then permitted to languish with only fractional and half-hearted implementation. And indeed, even though King himself was actively involved in, um, in the passage of that landmark legislation in the 1960s, um, he was very dispirited about the disconnection between that passage and any kind of concrete or material change. And in fact, in Where Do We Go From Here, he says, the practical cost of change for the nation up to this point has been cheap. So what he does um, 
across his career and especially at the end of his life is to try to connect those um, democratic ideals to um, policies that will change the living uh, conditions and experiences of African-American citizens. He calls for the abolition of poverty. He calls for a basic income, for reconstruction of education and employment, for access to housing, and for a social and economic bill of rights. And just as Du Bois's arguments about reconstruction as something that was um, a movement that was largely and importantly black led in many ways, but had benefits for all Americans. King too is drawing on a history of African American activism to use that history as a way of making life better um, for everyone. I wanted to stop there and, and see if there were, uh, I'm not sure if there are questions or Andy, I, if you wanted to jump in before I turn to the next part of the yeah. talk. Uh, first of all, there's a really robust conversation going on in the chat box and I appreciate uh, Jay helping to uh, inspire that. But um, I think as you laid out these four, these four people, these four men, and as they bring, as they come through the chronology, um, I'm interested in how our teachers are thinking about ways to, you know, the question still is how do you connect present to past? And what kinds of things do young people uh, start to understand and, and can start to associate? And there've been a couple of suggestions that I'm, I'm interested in your own feedback and your own response, Laurie. Uh, the first is, is the, the right for clean water in Flint, Michigan. Um, mm. I feel like that's a an, an interesting entry point to this conversation. The second is the uh, documentary 13th. So those are both great, um, great examples. And um, I have not used the documentary 13th in my classes, although I, I have recommended it to students. Um, and I do think the questions of mass incarceration and policing are um, that that's one of the policy areas where there are so many clear lines um, from the 13th Amendment itself, um, which leaves um, a loophole for um, in a form of, of unpaid or enslaved labor um, for people who are imprisoned through to convict leasing, um, through um, to to mass, the emergence of mass incarceration in the 1970s and beyond. So that I think that's a, a, a terrific resource. Um, and, and the Flint example is I also, I think, really important because students are increasingly conscious of um, the interconnections between environmental challenges and environmental inequities and racism. And so um, it's, uh, um, I, you know, I mean, the, the, the sad truth is that, that there are countless examples um, that those connections can be made. I mean, most, most recently and perhaps most obviously um, in, the, um, in the case of um, COVID-19, I don't know how many of us are nimble enough to be teaching the pandemic as it's playing out, but I think this is a place where the ongoing arguments about the devaluation of Black lives um, is um, you can't you can't turn away from it. That said, um, there were a lot of very smart people who thought that Hurricane Katrina in 2005 was going to change everything, um, precisely because we were watching um, a lack of concern in real time on our televisions um, as U.S. citizens were being, you know, were being abandoned. And um, what is worrisome is the number of Hurricane Katrinas that we have had um, since then. But I will say uh, Spike Lee's When the Levees Broke, which is massive, um, it, it's four discs, I think. You can't use all of it, but but even taking just pieces of it um, is another very powerful tool for bringing the the past into the present. 
Yes, thank you. Um, and I do, it's funny, as you were uh, answering that question, I felt a, uh, a tap on my shoulder and uh, Joseph leaned forward and he reminded me that Ida B. Wells is in fact a woman. And I inadvertently and mistakenly said the men that you mentioned. So that was my brain cramp. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Well, why don't, um, why don't I move forward just because I have a few other things that I do want to, to mention and then we yeah. can come back to, um, uh, to more questions and, and comments. Um, whoops, sorry, I overshot. Um, I wanted to think about, uh, to move now from these historical figures to thinking about key features of reparations arguments, that they can take many forms, that they could be made at many levels, they have risks, and that they're not a panacea. Um, reparations are often associated in popular consciousness with individual per capita payments, and that is a part of some proposals. However, part of what's striking is the ways in which reparations activists, past and present, have been extraordinarily creative in connecting arguments for reparations to a wide range of policies. So here is um, James Foreman, um, who uh, interrupted services at Riverside Church in 1969, demanding $500 million from white churches and synagogues on behalf of the National Black Economic Development Conference. The document is called the Manif Black Manifesto. It's a great teaching document, um, but it uses um, racially pejorative language that you know you should make sure you read it through thoroughly before you introduce it in the classroom. Um, but look at some of the things that they suggest. A Southern land bank, um, uh, and land is a recurrent feature of reparations arguments. Various kinds of support for um, education. Uh, welfare rights, um, telecommunications, it looks quaint now, but you know, you could imagine it could be updated. They call for TV and radio to include social media and other forms of, um, uh, of communications, uh, labor support, a strike fund and funding for business co-ops with Africa. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but it gives you a sense um, of, of the ways in which um, reparations demands have not simply been thought of as a one-time kind of one and done um, check. One thing I wanted to mention is I saw um, some uh, uh, comments also about uh, indigenous histories. And I do think that it is important to note that reparations demands do not need to be zero sum. In fact, the Congressional Black Congress um, was active in supporting the um, reparations for Japanese Americans in the 1980s. Um, but the one place where I think there is some tension is in the demand uh, for land. Um, land hunger, as Du Bois put it, has been a crucial part um, of the vision of reparations uh, from, from the beginning. Um, but there is always also the question of that land having been occupied um, and, and the degree to which um, any provision of land is dependent on the dispossession of people who um, lived there before. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about contemporary African-American and indigenous political thought is the degree to which um, activists and scholars are actually thinking together about these issues now and trying to, um, to connect them. Um, so past to present, uh, the movement for Black Lives um, and the policy platform that they put out in 2016. Again, this is just supposed to give you a sense of the range of different kinds of things um, that could be incorporated in programs for reparations. It's also worth noting that um, the legislative initiatives that they discussed were at all levels. Um, so they could be at municipal levels, state levels, national. Um, the second point is that reparations can be made at different levels. So um, for example, the UN um, Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent said that African Americans were owed reparations in their 2016 um, uh, 2016 report. Um, and it's also worth noting that, that there is a long history of um, 
solidarities among uh, reparations and anti-racist and anti-colonial activists across national lines. So um, this has often been an international um, an international struggle. Another example um, is a regional demand by the Caribbean nations um, in 2013, a 10 point program for reparations. And here too, you can see the range of different kinds of things that they're talking about. Um, resources for public health, literacy eradication, uh, technology transfer, debt cancellation. And one thing that's worth noting uh, with regard to the debt is that you know one of the largest reparations programs ever put in place was the indemnity program um, that France demanded of Haiti in the early 19th century um, as the price of their liberation. So Haiti um, successfully revolted um, and then the French um, demanded uh, something like, I think it was something like 25 billion francs uh, in indemnity for their loss of property in, um, in slaves. There are also um, efforts at the national level like HR 40, uh, which we discussed at the beginning. Um, and there have been a whole range of different kinds of um, proposals, uh, also lawsuits in the federal, uh, federal legal system and, um, and so forth. And then there are also um, efforts at state and local levels. So this is just one example. In 2015, the city of Chicago paid, um, promised five and a half million dollars for compensation um, for a decades long a practice of police torture of African-American men. Now, part of what I think is so striking about the Chicago um, response is that, first of all, it was, um, it was a hard fought struggle by activists in Chicago so that this is something that the people of the city demanded. It is also creative and multifaceted. Uh, it includes public education um, measures. It includes an apology uh, as well as financial compensation. But it's also limited. Anyone who, uh, I don't know if there are participants in Chicago, but certainly um, it is not a solution to all of the problems of policing in Chicago, racial injustice there. But I think it's, a, it's an example of the ways in which reparations have been a mechanism in recent history for coming to terms um, with the crimes of the past. So I said that there were four features I wanted to mention. Um, the See other one backwards here. Yeah, there we go. Going backwards. I should have put in another uh, one. Um, That's okay. Reparations have risks. Um, one, one risk, and this was uh, something that came out in the hearings, is that reparations can be a distraction that a focus on the past can um, take away attention from present day inequities, that it can be a pipe dream as opposed to pursuing policies that have a chance of, you know, of really taking hold. Uh, a, second, um, a second concern is the reparations are divisive. Um, majority of white Americans oppose um, reparations and there's a concern that it makes more sense that you can get more change with universal policies, that is policies that don't name race, racial injustice. And this was um, the, uh, you know, one of the arguments that Barack Obama, for instance, made in his own opposition to reparations. And one thing, actually, yeah. I, Laura, I'd like to pause you just for a moment because there's actually been a lot of conversation in the chat box that may tie into those last two points. Great. Um, and, and in some ways, uh, our friend Enrico Bruna, who's a PhD student at the University of Iowa, sums it up when he says that uh, when he talks to his students about reparations, uh, he notes that they equate the term reparations with checks in the mail model and believes that they're against it. But when they start to discuss undoing government mandated racist policies over the last hundred plus years, and even infusing federal money into communities of color, they're suddenly uh, okay with the concept, at least uh, on the surface. So then there's been other questions about the term reparations and whether that's a barrier. If that 
is there a better term that might be used? You know, we're humanists, we know language matters. Um, Joseph brought this up uh, initially and then several other folks chimed in and wondered if terms like restitution or atonement or um, amends or something might be better and might not be the stumbling block that the term reparations is. How do you, how do you think about those, uh, those points? I think those are all really important points. And um, I think that there's a real question about whether the language of reparations opens up a conversation or shuts it down. Um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about alternatives like redress, um, restitution, um, a, you know, certainly apology or atonement. Part of the reason that I have come back to the language of reparations again and again, I think there are three reasons. One is that this is a language that has a, had extraordinary power um, in African-American uh, political activism and, and thought, so that it is a term that even though the figures I focused on did not use explicitly, um, it's a term with a, um, a deep history. The second is that it's a term that has been extremely important globally. Um, it has been um, a primary way of understanding how to move from tyranny and violence to something like democracy. Um, and the third is that I have not found a, a language that's <laughs> that, that captures that combination of um, the acknowledgement of history with a plan to um, to do things differently in the future. And that also combines both the symbolic and the material. Um, one of the really disturbing things that happened uh, around the turn of the 21st century was that there was a spate of um, apologies and expressions of regret for slavery, for Jim Crow, for other racialized crimes. Uh, Virginia actually would sort of led the way on this. And what was striking about so many of those apologies, and this is also true of the congressional apologies, um, was that they called for reconciliation, um, but they explicitly divided, uh, divided that call for reconciliation from any consideration of liability or reparations. So I think reparations is flawed, but it does, um, because it does carry with it that sense that there must be an economic component, even if it's not purely an economic argument. I think it's really um, maybe the best language out there, even though as, as a number of people have said, it's, um, it, it can be misleading and, and people um, have a wide range of associations with it that are not, you know, not necessarily constructive. So I used to say that um, that the argument that I was constructing was an anti-anti reparations argument. And this is part of the problem, I think, is that um, the arguments against reparations, particularly the idea of, of a democratic reconstruction, may be relatively weak, um, but the language of reparations does bring with it a whole lot of baggage that um, can get in the way. Uh, sadly, I don't know if any humanists have actually come up with a silver bullet word that can <laughs> cover all the ground, um, but it's a really important and ongoing problem. So the question I just asked in some ways was, I think an intellectual one in terms of policy, from your point of view as an educator, are there terms that may allow younger students to enter into this conversation better? Well, I think that there's a way in which um, reparations, one of the beauties of reparations is the simplicity of the idea of reparative or corrective justice. Um, right. So even though I'm making a, a democratic argument, I, I actually think um, for getting a sense of what reparations means, um, the, I think the question is if you um, do wrong, um, if you uh, demand from people for centuries, um, their families, their time, um, their labors, 
uh, is something owed for that. Um, and I think that, that that's where reparations can do a kind of work that other languages can't. I think atonement is a very powerful um, idea, but it's also a depoliticizing one and it can leave uh, power relations un, um, unaddressed and unchanged. Right. Great. Thank you for going down that uh, down that path for a little bit. It, it was a it's a question, you know, again, as teachers, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out ways to uh, to explain and to make uh, content accessible to younger people or non experts. And I think that was important to spend a little bit of time on. Thank you. The other thing that I would say, and, I'll, you know, this is, the, I think, the very last slide I'm not sure that I'll talk about um, where I have some suggestions for future reading um, is is that sometimes the best way to to think about reparations especially with younger students is to um to introduce them to texts that help them to think about the relationship between the past and the present um and then the idea of reparations i think emerges more organically uh, i think that for me is why du bois was so important um he made it impossible for me not to think about reparations, even though he never made an argument for them. Right. Uh, and uh, so, uh, for instance, I I think something like um, you know Toni Morrison's novels would be one one example, especially Song of Solomon and Beloved. Um, those are tough going for for high school students, but um, that would be one way in. So there, there are a, a couple of other things I wanted to say about the risks um, of, of reparations. Um, you know, there's a, always a risk of backlash, although it should be said that every major um, social justice measure, civil rights measure in the US has incurred a significant backlash. Um, and But there's always uh, the risk of implying um, or, or reinforcing a narrative that too much has been done. Um, what's interesting is that uh, Andrew Johnson uh, made a version of that argument in 1865, so it is also a very tired argument that's had a long life. There's a worry, too, um, of disappointment, I think, especially from um, the communities and the individuals um, who should benefit most from any reparations programs, uh, that the gap between the promise and the actual the reality may be such um, that it will feel like a um, a sham or a you know a, a um, insubstantial response to problems that are so deep and uh, so longstanding. I think the biggest worry about reparations demands and and here's where I think the language of reparations is especially um, problematic, where I would say I'm most ambivalent about um its use is there's always a danger of premature closure which is to say that um that reparations programs um could be used as a justification for stopping the conversation about history about racial justice and so the key is to envision reparations in a way that it's an opening and not a closing and finally, that which connects to the idea that reparations are not a panacea. No single program, idea, word um, can solve um, the complex and deep um, inequities. Uh, no single word, program, idea can help people realize freedom that they've been denied. So reparations could only ever be one piece of that. And if you have thoughts or questions, I'm going to see if I can get back to the wait, get back to the beginning. I mean, sorry, to the end. Um, so uh, this this uh, next point connects to many of the questions and comments that have been made, and that is, um, you know, is how to connect reparations. Um, the question of reparations to the present. Ta-Nehisi Coates does it through an account of housing, of um, the ways in which segregated housing in the North um, 
not only kept people in poverty, but actually led to deteriorating circumstances for many people. Um, 13th is a great way of introducing questions of mass incarceration and policing. Um, access to, to decent education and also access to education that um, tells the full story of slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, and the present. And that also sees how these issues are connected to others. Um, with regard to mass incarceration and policing, for example, I think it's worthwhile to think with students about how the punitive policies that created mass incarceration in the 20th century um, have been deployed um, in the policing of immigrants in the 21st. So we can see also how these issues are connected. And voting, I think, in many ways, may be one of the most powerful ones because it was so deeply tied to Reconstruction. Um, and it was um, undone so forcefully um, with the exclusion of African Americans from the ballot for, you know, over another, almost another century. Um, and then contemporary uh, struggles over voting rights as an ongoing way of connecting these past issues um, to the present. I wanted to stop there to see if there were comments or um, thoughts about, about these connections, because I think that's really the key, um, is to, to thinking about how to link the past to our present and to a democratic future. We've got a lot of questions that have started to queue up in comments. Um, let me let me start uh, as I scroll through these, Laurie. Let me start with a question that that Jay actually asked, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about either the either the role of or the lack of role of states in this conversation. Is this simply a federal conversation, or or have states tried to move in this direction? So it it. States have um, been involved in these conversations. As I said, there were quite a few states that um, uh, issued resolutions expressing uh, regret for slavery, uh, for Jim Crow, and for other kinds of um, other kinds of crimes. Uh, in 1999, the state of Florida um, paid reparations for um, the Rosewood massacre, which took place in 1923. Um, which was a, a race riot early in the 20, 20th century. Um, there have been states where there have been commissions who have, that have been designed to consider reparations for specific issues um, or um, events uh, for the Tulsa riot of 1921 and closer to home, for those of you in North Carolina, the Wilmington riot of 1898. And in both of those cases, um, no, uh, no reparations um, were were paid, even though there was a recommendation. So part of the idea here is that every level of our um, lives as citizens uh, matters here. And of course, we also haven't talked about uh, the ways in which private corporations uh, have been implicated. Some of them have, um, made made some efforts but minimal um and we have corporations today that are the current incarnations of corporations that profited from slavery from the slave trade universities and colleges are another example um so all yeah, kinds of yeah i was actually going to ask you to go a little bit more in depth about the the issue of universities um, you mentioned georgetown earlier of course there are uh, many schools in the Northeast or many schools all over, but how how are universities sort of grappling with the the legacy um, of of slavery in their past? Well, so there there are a lot of different kinds of legacies. So Brown University, for instance, um, which is in Rhode Island, which was not a, a slave holding state, and you know um, for very long in the history of the U.S. Um, but was a place where a great deal of wealth uh, was made in the slave trade. Um, and a, a lot of that wealth contributed to the founding of the institution. 
they established a center for the study of slavery and justice and, and have a lot of ongoing projects. Um, the University of Virginia, which was built by enslaved labor, um, which also educated um, many of the architects of US slavery um, and into the 20th century was also a site where eugenics um, was studied. Um, and so there is a kind of ongoing, you know, connected history. There has been some effort at UVA, there are commissions to study the, the role of enslaved work, workers. There's a monument that was supposed to be unveiled um, before um, the campus was was shut down. Um, but I think that that the hardest link is um, is the one that connects the scholarship, which is, I think, being actively supported at a lot of institutions, the public apologies and the memorials, which are really crucial, to thinking about present day questions like labor practices. Um, who has acts, who can afford to attend these institutions? What's their relationship with the predominantly non-white communities that may surround them? So those are the connections that I think still need to be made. Um, and uh, those are gonna be harder to make than establishing a commission to study the history of slavery. But it's extraordinary that so many places have, have at least made that first move. Thank you. It's it's a little bit sideways. I don't know um, if it's entirely uh, relevant to this conversation, but I wonder if you have a comment on um, on the if not, there, I guess they're not reparations, but the compensation given to wealthy British slave owners in the mid 19th century uh, who were compensated by the British government for the losses when slavery was abolished, and only recently, I think, has that debt been paid off by British citizens and taxpayers. Yeah, I mean, I think that's of a piece with, um, you know, with the indemnification of France by Haiti, um, with Lincoln's last ditch effort to avert civil war by having what was called compensated emancipation, which meant compensating the, the um, slave owners. I think that's part of the burden of the argument, whatever you think about reparations, is flipping that script so that um, it's not the propertied um, who, to, you know, to whom the debt is owed, but it's the people who have done the work and, um, and who have fought uh, hard. I mean, I think part of what's so important, too, to take from Du Bois's um, uh, comments is who have not simply been victims, but have been actors, have been the enactors of democracy in the US to the extent to which um, we have had it. We have just a few minutes left, Laurie. I wonder if you can uh, share with us the suggested readings that you mentioned. Sure. So I had a, a, a very hard time. There's so much to read. So what I thought was um, Robin Kelly's argument, which is actually, it's, it's a day of reckoning is the, the first part of the title, but from his book, Freedom Dreams, is a wonderful history. Um, it teaches beautifully, students really respond to it. Um, so it's just a chapter from a book. Um, there are three new books. Uh, one I saw was mentioned um, uh, in the, the chat. Uh, William Darity and Kirsten Mullins from Here to Equality, which just came out. Um, I've read not all of it, but most of it. Um, and uh, they make, I think, a very powerful economic and moral argument. Catherine Frank, who is a law professor, um, looks at those experiments of self-government um, in the um, uh, Sea Islands of South Carolina and at Davis Bend in Mississippi and builds an argument for them. And then um, Ana Lucia Araujo's uh, Reparations for Slavery and the Slave Trade is wonderful because it's transnational and really sort of shifts the focus out. Finally, I suggested some poetry and fiction that have worked beautifully in the classroom. Um, four of the selections are novels. I think Kindred is one that um, uh, that high school students could could tackle. It's there's some real violence there, but it's also beautifully written and very accessible. Same with Homegoing, 
And then Claudia Rankin's Citizen, which is a prose poem and just extraordinary and could be excerpted um, and also is wonderful in the classroom. But this is a, a very, very inadequate list. Um, there's much more. And I would encourage our participants to, um, before you leave the room tonight, take your mouse and cursor and go to the chat box and scrape all the way up and save the chat because I saw a lot of folks who were making suggestions of other readings that they would either found important in their understanding of the topic or in their classroom. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, uh, Jay, who has just put together a well-researched uh, Google document that he shared in the chat box. And so feel free to borrow that, to add to it, to share your thoughts on it. We're almost out of time, Laurie. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I, I'm actually going to reserve this for myself as the moderator. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, this is what professors and historians and humanists and American studies folks don't like to do, maybe. Um, uh -oh. Laurie, are you optimistic? How do you, how do you think this is going to play out in the near future? Um, no, I am not optimistic. Um, and at the risk of stealing from, um, from many, you know, more powerful thinkers, um, I think that the distinction between optimism and hope remains an important one. Um, du Bois talked about a hope, unhopeful yet not hopeless, which I realize is very convoluted. Maybe that is a humanities response. I think it's important to retain, to remain hopeful, that is to keep thinking and arguing and fighting. I'm not optimistic because I think that the evidence um, is so powerful that um, the opportunities to make these kinds of changes have been, um, have been Sorry missed. There you go. Are you there? Yes. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I was, I was, uh, I interrupted you. I very much apologize. Um, Owen reminded me that I had hoped to do the poll again, so I clicked the poll manage poll button, and it took me off my screen. Unfortunately, I don't think we can do it again because we only loaded one poll in, and we basically used it up. So, I'm sorry. Continue with your thoughts. Optimism and hope. Um, I'm yeah. sorry for the. So I, I, I think it's essential to remain hopeful. James Baldwin always said the despair was not a luxury he could afford, and I think that's you know, that's the right attitude. But I think that, you know, the history of the U.S. is not one that um, that rewards optimism. So um, that's how I would parse that. Thank you so much. We very much appreciate your uh, your thoughts and your expertise and the materials that you curated for us. Uh, Laurie, please be well. Thank you for joining our webinar series tonight. Thank you. I hope everyone takes care. And I want to thank uh, all of our attendees for joining tonight's session as well. Um, Jai, uh, Jai, Jay, now that I'm thinking of it, please do make the Google Doc that you created open so that folks can visit it and share it. I want to thank all of you for, uh, for being here tonight. Please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media feeds. Our Facebook and our Twitter feed are probably the most active, and it gives you updates on upcoming uh, opportunities and deadlines and uh, things that we decide to do. That includes the Teacher Advisory Council, in which I hope to see many of you apply by May the 22nd. Our next session, uh, next to last session, is actually a pop-up webinar. This was added much late in the uh, the year as a response to the current pandemic. Uh, we'll be working with Mike Fontaine, uh, who is a professor of classics at Cornell, and his brother, Richard Fontaine, who's the CEO of the Center for New American Security. Uh, the Fontaine boys will be working with us on uh, Consoliasho, uh, coping with a collapsing world. That is, how does uh, antiquity, how do uh, classic readings and writings, how do they help inform us of grieving and loss and how as humans to respond to it? I hope you've signed up. And if so, I'll see you next Tuesday. Um, if you would like to join our last session, that's the rescheduled session with Nicholas Dames on Pride and Prejudice. That'll be next Thursday. And I think there's likely a few more seats left. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to open the uh, the survey, end of uh, session survey. When you complete it, you'll be able to um, access your certificate. Thanks again, everybody. Please be well, be safe, um, do the best you can in the online teaching world, and um, I'll see you next time in the Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night.